Um, I'm currently doing my laundry at uh, 3 in the morning uh, because it's the only time where there's not a lot of people in here. Um, there's only about like three machines and I feel awkward when I walk in and all three of those machines are kind of taken up. So um, yeah, the logical solution to this problem is 3 a.m. Yeah. What's interesting? Ah, I got it. How about some movie history with a little side of murder? The artist. The artiste. The poet. I will talk to you of art. The figure model who loves to show it. I'm almost naked. Suppose he could be physically attracted to her? No, man, he ain't the type. You don't get enough vitamin E. All these are beat. All these you'll meet in a bucket of blood. Let us make the scene. Crazy. Come, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Where the hilarious enjoy the horrifying in a bucket of blood. No, you're gonna shoot me! Don't shoot! Ah! Shut up! Murdered man. Come to the land of living dreams, where realists dream of the unreal. Walter, you've done something to me. Something deep down inside of my prana. I'm sorry, Mr. Don't be sorry, be a bus boy. Oh, Walter, I wanna be with you. You're creative. Beatniks at their bawdiest. The creative urge at its most primitive. I'm deeply moved. <laughs> and I shall compose a poem. Love is art. Art is love. There is nothing else. It's the weirdest and the wildest. I don't want to make statues anymore. I, I want to get married. To you. gonna make next Walter our story starts with a guy named Roger Corman he is a very very famous director in the 1950s is where he really really cemented his legend but it was very difficult to compete with names like MGM or Universal so they had to rely on shock horror blood violence sex exploitation we got to make a movie, we got to make it cheap, we've got to make it fast, and we've got to make a lot of money from, from it. That's where Roger Corman comes in. Roger Corman was a legend for making movies fast, cheap, and on the fly. So the production company American International Pictures was really, really well known for these kind of um, small, small movies. And uh, they said to Roger Corman, they go, hey, we want something... Um, Horror. Roger Corman's, of course, like, okay, sounds good, sounds good, yeah. And then they said this, we want you to do it with $50,000, which is, of course, pocket change. Challenge accepted. Now, his previous record uh, for making a movie was six days. Making a movie in six days is not an easy thing to do, uh, especially one that's going to be uh, released to America. He has it in his mind that he's going to break that record. So he's got this monumental task of creating this movie in six days with a budget of $50,000. He gets Chuck Griffith, uh, a really, really good screenwriter, to help him pin the script. Um, they go out one night and they basically just have a cafe crawl. They go from cafe to cafe to cafe, seeing the sites, seeing the people that inhabit these spaces and, and try to really get in their minds. And at the end of the night, they have their script. The story is simple. You have a busboy who works at a beatnik bar, and the busboy wants to be an artist. He wants to make statues and sculptures, but he's not very good with clay. Um, so he comes home one night, late from work, and uh, his landlady says, hey, my cat's missing, keep an eye out. And he's like, sure, uh, yeah, I'll keep an eye out, whatever. He goes to his home, he's bought 
a big thing of clay and he's ready to start. But of course, like I mentioned, the guy sucks. And then suddenly he hears something. What was that? Oh, what's the matter, Frankie? How'd you get yourself stuck in a wall? The cat is trapped in the wall. Now, in Screenwriting 101, you learn about the saving the cat moment, the moment where the hero rises up and does something heroic to let everybody know that this character, this character right here is the hero. This character is the one you will empathize with. This is the character you will cheer on. And... Our hero, everyone. So of course, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And when life gives you a dead cat, for some reason, you want to make a statue. So he takes a bunch of plaster of Paris and clay and puts it around the cat, encasing it in this hard shell, making it look like a statue. How come you put a knife into it? I didn't mean to. Walter's statue of a dead cat is very, very popular. Everyone seems to really, really like it, and he's the talk of the town. So, of course, as an artist, what do you do? You make more. And that involves murder. Um, but what's interesting is, throughout the murders, the writers surprisingly keep a lot of sympathy for him, as if he's not really aware that what he's doing is wrong, that he's just fulfilling the artistic desire to create. How many days did it take them to finish it? Five days. Um, how, 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 much, how much money do they spend? Uh, you know, did they come in under $50,000? 35K. 35K. Give this man a raise. Here is the interesting part. Like I said, it's in the 1950s. It's a completely different kind of layout. Nowadays, a movie is made, it's set to many theaters, uh, people watch it, it makes a bunch of money, um, and then it leaves theaters. But then, we distribute it. We distribute it through DVDs, Blu-rays, or digital copies, right? In the 1950s, they don't have any of that. What do you do? Well, you forget about it. If the movie is not freaking legendary, it comes out, it goes to a few theaters, a few people see it, and it disappears. And for AIP... They have to continually, continually be making all of these movies very, very, very quickly if they want to make a profit. They have to make one, market it, done, move on to the next one. And it has to just go and go and go and go and go and go and go like a machine. There, there we go. Just feed the machine. Just feed the machine. I found this one quote from Dick Miller, the guy who played the original Walter. Basically, his thinking, Roger Corman, was this. We're going to make this movie. It's going to play in a couple of theaters for a month or two, and then it's garbage. Garbage. American International Pictures had the exact same way of thinking. They said basically we're just going to make it, we're going to market it, we're going to ship it out, it's garbage, it's done, move on. There, there we go, just feed the machine, just feed the machine. And so because of that, they didn't give any real, real, real thought into like the future of these films, because as far as they're concerned, it's gone and forgotten. No one's ever going to remember it. And so because of that, a lot of Roger Corman's early movies slipped right into public domain, just slipped right into public domain, just slipped in there, just slipped right in there, just gone, public domain, gone. He doesn't get a single cent from that. Where was I? Oh yeah. This Roger Corman doesn't get a red cent for any of his earlier work. So what do you do? Remakes. A similar thing happened with George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. He uh, didn't copyright it, so it went into public domain. And uh, because of that, well, a lot of people have tried to make a few remakes. I think there's been two um, to try to kind of help him reclaim his, uh, his work. He decides to remake it in 1995 um, as part of a Showtime series that he was doing at the time. And uh, they remake it, but they set it in the 90s. In the 1995 one, we have uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Of course, you may know from The Breakfast Club as the nerd. Um, 
he does an okay job. He does a good job. The problem is he doesn't quite uh, capture the same innocence as Dick Miller does. Uh, he does come across as very, very, very intensely creepy. Which I know is strange because I'm talking about a movie where the main character kills people and then covers them with plaster and passes them off as works of art. But also you have Sam Lloyd, who most of you might know as Ted from Scrubs, who plays Walter Paisley's boss. The love interest is played by Justine Bateman. Get away from me, Walter! Um, and uh, also David Cross is in this one. See, I spell the word feel with an extra E to emphasize exactly Excuse how... Excuse me. And then this is also, I think, I haven't been able to find an earlier one, but I think this is Will Ferrell's first on-screen performance. I don't have the funds to be buying various pieces of artwork. Good luck, though. Yeah. Ow. It's very Will Ferrell. When it comes right down to it, both movies are incredibly similar to each other. In fact, there are times where you're watching the 1995 one, and they take they take um, they take dialogue directly from the first one, and. I'm not upset with that. Absolutely not upset with that. Because the dialogue from the first one is so absolutely perfect. If you changed it, it would really be like drawing a smiley face on the Mona Lisa. Of course, there's a lot of new things that they add into it, but that's awesome too. Um, for example, take this scene. These are uh, from our Roadkill series. I take the pictures. I do the research. Oh. As a matter of fact, we actually do the driving as well. That's one of the new pieces of dialogue, but the beat matches the original dialogue from the first one perfectly. And personally, I feel like it really, really does capture the, the spirit. Um, and I also think that it's kind of mom, it's kind of, and personally, I, th I feel like it's, it's uh, very good at mocking the 90s with their kind of grunge and their extreme kind of attitude. Well, that about wraps it up. It's a tiny chapter in the legend of Roger Corman, but it's one of my favorites. If you ever get a chance to watch one of his movies, don't hesitate, you'll thank yourself. Now, if you will excuse me, I've been here for two hours, it's 5 a.m. I'm starving. But I'll leave you with this. What do you want? Well, as long as you're here, you might as well listen. Remember Mad TV? I got something to say about wanting, not getting. Remember the character Stuart? But I don't talk with my mouth. I hope that's okay. Yeah, same guy. So remember, life is just an intermission, at least until we meet again.